Can, can I make a comment? The, the Zoom link sent to us didn't work. I had to go into Zoom and add the meetings having signed in. Um, Clicking on the link didn't work. That's strange. Well, it's it's worked for quite a few people. Yes, it worked for me. Because they all got the same link. Mm. Worked for me. My I, had to, me. I, had, I had to put the code in, whereas normally yes. it not works straight through. But it doesn't matter. It did work. I think in the short time that we've got available together for this one-off meeting, could I hand over to the chairman? Because I think we've got to start on time. Absolutely. Whatever thank, happens. Thanks, Barry. Hope, hopefully, John will join us very, very shortly. Um, if, if not, we'll we'll rejig the agenda um, on 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 the hoof. Because uh, I think uh, the, the first thing is we're going to start and we're going to end on time. So what happens in the interim is is going to be flexible for us to decide uh, amongst ourselves. So without without further ado, thank you ever ever so much for everybody joining. I mean, it's lovely to see so many faces, uh, old old and new, um, and, and it's it's brilliant to have such a such a crowd on online uh, on a Monday evening. So I appreciate everybody joining. Thank you ever so much. Today marks uh, the UN Day, so every year the UN gathers to celebrate and uh, its uh, UN Charter and look for look forward. In particular, when I was looking at the UNA Day website uh, today, building back together for peace and prosperity was, was their focus, which is very much in line with what's gathering us here, here today to reflect upon the 10th anniversary of the event United for Peace and Prosperity that happened in Church Stratton 10 years ago. That was a fantastic two-day event that I think many of us on, on the call will remember very fondly uh, of, of meeting many of you there 10 years ago. And, and we we're also joined by the esteemed uh, Sir Jeremy Greenstock as a guest speaker amongst many other people. And I think it's it's important to say from the beginning for, for everybody is that Sir Jeremy is still very invested in, in this and the event, what's come from it. Uh, I know Barry's been in, in contact with him and, and had feedback up until the, the last few days, wishing us very well uh, for this event and everything that's going to come for it. Equally, uh, the, the recently appointed chair of UNA UK, Baroness Adelaide, she uh, sends her apologies for not being able to make it tonight, but she uh, is, is eager to hear how it, how it goes. So today marks just, just one day, one event in, in the 10 year journey that's, that's come from the event in Church Stratton and hopefully go on further. I think there's been, there's been ups and downs in activity since then. But uh, I think it's still impressive that we're able to gather here today and reflect on reflect on that uh, still with so many of us here. And I'm, I'm glad to see quite a few more joining as we're doing the intro here. I think Barry's uh, spent a lot of time putting together newsletters that I think you've all all received. So that's really bringing us up to speed with what's happened uh, and, and the various individuals this evening. But really, we're here to, to both reflect uh, on, on what's happened, learn from what's happened, and perhaps more importantly, use this as a, a, a discussion point and a, and a platform to, to think about the future, looking forward and thinking what we as, as UNA branches within the central region and, and UNA as a central region can, can do more to promote peace and prosperity. So, Thank you. Thank you also to, to the various uh, people that are going to speak tonight. Uh, we've got quite, quite a great coverage from across the region, uh, different branches, different cities. In, indeed, we've got Rhys Edmonds, uh, who's joining us all the way from the from the US. Uh, so, so we're spanning different time zones as well. So it's brilliant, uh, like I said, to see so many. And thank you also for your continued feedback. I know Barry has collected 118 discrete pieces of feedback throughout this process from, from people, which is just fantastic to hear about. We've got a, a loose agenda today, um, which is, is already uh, perhaps going to change, given that I don't think John has, has managed to join you. I, I, I've just seen John join. He's connecting his audio. Um, but we've, we've got a loose agenda that we, we don't need to 
fit too strictly, but we are going to, well, we have started on time and we're going to end on time. So those are, those are the perimeters. And we, I'd encourage you all to, to speak up uh, when, when we go to the Q&A sections to get as much involvement from, from everybody. If, uh, if there are too many questions, which is always a, a nice problem to have, we'll car park a few, we'll set them aside to be answered in the coming days. John, are you, are you there? Can you hear us? Uh, I am. Can you hear me? That's it. We can indeed. Good. Well, can. Hopefully everybody else can. If if you don't mind, I, I, I'll, I'll throw you straight into it, if, that, if that's it, John, after a brief intro, intro. That's fine. Thank you. So, so we're very fortunate to have, have John Howard here with us this evening. Uh, John's been involved with the UNA UK for a, for a long time now. Uh, and, and very shortly after after the UNA uh, Shropshire and, and Central Region event ten years ago, um, commenced discussions with Barry and has been back and forth ever since with, with both UNA UK and, and the region and the local branch. John is a Methodist minister and he was a mission partner in Bethlehem. During his time, he wrote several newsletters and articles, some of which were featured in, in the UNA UK magazine that I'm sure many of you are familiar with. And he's recently written a, a, a book uh, called uh, Hope, in, Hope in Israel and Palestine. I can recommend the book. Uh, thoroughly, Stories of Hope and Prospects for Peace Within the Region. So without further ado, I'll hand over to you, John, for your reflections. Thank you. Thank you very much. And apologies for the difficulties um, which uh, we've had in uh, with um, we're getting on to this, this call. Um, I, I wanted to focus uh, for this evening on um, the, 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 the title, in a sense, that I've used for the book, which has just been mentioned, Hope in Israel, Palestine, because I've been very conscious in um, recent years um, doing talks on uh, the subject of um, the situation uh, within the West Bank, Gaza, uh, and Israel, Palestine in general, um, of people making the comment, what hope is there for change? How long have we been in this situation? How long has this conflict continued? How long have the injustices been present? Uh, what hope is there for change? And I think it's fair to say that amongst the political situation, it's not been easy to see in recent years since the Oslo Accord had run into the sand, quite where the political progress would come from. And so I wanted to write the book and I wanted to present within the book the sense that I have from being in Israel, Palestine, from living there and from twice being a human rights observer there, that the hope for the future in many ways lies with the grassroots work that's been done on the ground by a whole range of different organizations. There are seven that I've outlined in um, the book, which um, uh, is entitled Hope in Israel Palestine. And indeed, there are many other projects taking place on the ground, which in different ways are bringing people together, are sowing seeds, are enabling people of Palestinian descent and people of Israeli descent to meet each other, to understand each other to have a better sense of the situation and why it is that it is such a difficult political situation to solve. And it feels to me from experience of these organizations that there is a kind of a foundation, there is a, a groundwork being done, which perhaps was not done sufficiently in advance of the Oslo Accords. And that really needs to be present if a true peaceful solution is to be found. I think it can be argued that the reason that the Oslo Accords uh, have 
not been able to produce the two-state solution that was hoped for, um, that there would be more than one reason for this. But one of them certainly would be that the groundwork hadn't really been done, that there was not the uh, sufficient of a dialogue going on at ordinary, if you like, grassroots level. And that um, some of the organizations that are now working at the grassroots level are making that difference. Uh, let me just give a couple of examples. Um, one would be um, the work of Masalaha, which uh, I know in the newsletters has been mentioned and uh, in one of the um, uh, Zoom calls that was a preparation for this evening, uh, the, uh, one of the directors of Musalaha was able to talk about the work uh, which they're engaged in. And it is impressive work in the sense that it works within, within a difficult environment. Um, many of the Israelis taking part have been in the army. Many of the Palestinians taking part have been, in one way or another, confronted by army personnel. And so a group that tries to bring two groups such as that together, two different groups of people like that together, is always going to be struggling. And yet, my experience of Musalaha, and I think it's fair to say um, that the kind of results they're bringing about in this conversation are quite remarkable. Uh, so what we find time and again is that when you bring young people together, and indeed when you bring people of other generations together in an environment where they can actually hear each other, where they can actually understand each other's point of view, then relationships can form and it's those relationships ultimately that will enable change to come about. Without relationships, what we end up with is two communities viewing each other, in this case, over a wall and not understanding the differences and the problems that each have. I also recently came back from being in Israel, Palestine again, um, as a human rights observer, I was in the Hebron region. Uh, and um, Hebron has often been described as um, the most violent of the cities of the West Bank, and it has particular problems. But even there, the time that I had helped me to see a number of groups that are doing this precisely this kind of foundation building work. Um, just an ex another example of, uh, of an organization that I don't mention in, in the book um, is um, the Hebron International Resource Network, uh, which um, is run by two very committed individuals. It doesn't have a huge amount of resource, but it works within um, the South Hebron Hills, the Yatta and Hebron areas, which are always very difficult areas to work in. And yet they succeed in um, connecting people and increasing understanding. So my belief is that it's this kind of foundational work that can make the difference and is the reason for hope in the future. I think that's probably about my 10 minutes. Uh, uh, and I think we'd move to questions and answers. Super, I, I, absolutely. Thank you ever so much for, for, for that, John, as, as a starting point. Um, I think I think there's many things there that resonate with 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 all of us on, on the call. And it's fantastic to hear your first hand experience from your two missions out, out there as a, an, an observer. Um, I think the, the best way here is if, you, uh, if, if you've got questions, if you can raise your, raise your hand either on screen or, or uh, 
through through Zoom itself, and we'll uh, try and have, start the discussion from there. Perhaps, uh, John, I, I can kick one off whilst whilst people uh, gather their thoughts. Is when when going through the book, the importance uh, of these relationships and, and organisations building relationships was, was paramount. And and something you mentioned, which I was particularly interested by, was the imagined fears. So the imagined fears between these communities and from the lack of interaction and, and the need for those that relationship building. I, I wonder if you could just perhaps elaborate on that for the group. Mm. Yes, I, I think there's these fears are generated um, in a number of different ways. One of the things are, um, which uh, is quite evident is that there is within Israel what I refer to as a founding myth. Now that doesn't necessarily, I'm not implying that a myth necessarily it doesn't have an element of truth within it. But um, the, the perception amongst many Israelis, and I found this in conversations on so many occasions, is in inverted commas, that all of the Arabs, as would be said, really just want to push us into the sea. Um, now, in having lived in the West Bank, um, I don't think I've come across anybody uh, amongst Palestinians that I've ever met who have ever expressed the desire to do that. Um, and indeed, the Palestinians that I meet, 95%, um, 99% probably would say that Israelis now have been living so long in um, uh, in the country, um, that um, they understand that that is their home, and it is a matter of finding the way of living together. But uh, I wonder if you can see from what I'm saying about the imagined uh, attitudes that exist um, by that founding myth that is so strong within um, Israel. Now, there is equivalent myth on the Palestinian side, it has to be said, but um, uh, in answer to the question, in a sense, I can only address one side, but I could have used examples from the other side, which are myths about Israel as well. I think, I think that makes complete sense and is, is really interesting to hear. Are there any any questions from anybody else on in, in the audience? If you're you can either un, unmute yourself and, and, and ask, or if you for those less familiar with Zoom, like myself, uh, if you if you hover down at the bottom, you've got this uh, reactions, and then you can raise a hand or, or feel free to type it in the chat. Jeff, I I, I just wonder if John could Jeff give Burkis. us. Any uh, could if John could give us some examples of, of the sort of conversations that um, that that he's heard um, understand the, um, the the myth and so on but um, but but how do they interact could could you give us a, a little flavor John um, I think this this is best responded to by giving examples of, of different organisations because each organisation has its own way of working and responding. Um, I mentioned Musalaha, and I think the group uh, is aware of, um, uh, of of the work there, which is dialogues between two different um, uh, groups of people within um, their. Um, their camps that they hold within the, the desert. Um, but I think another interesting organization um, from the point of view of this kind of thing is um, the Hand in Hand schools, um, which uh, exist uh, in um, uh, um, six different locations within uh, Israel itself. And the Hand in Hand schools are deliberately created in order to enable um, Palestinian citizens of Israel and um, uh, Jewish citizens of Israel to um, uh, be educated together for the, so the children will go to school together. Uh, and um, the aim is not simply to provide a, a, an education that, um, uh, that is both in Arabic and in Hebrew, uh, but 
uh, the aim is to bring the whole family network together. Uh, and so they refer to um, the way in which they have um, uh, often uh, 10 to 15 people that they bring together for each child in their school because they're bringing parents, they're bringing uh, cousins, they're bringing um, people of the community. And so they enable people um, to meet and understand each other, uh, celebrating the festivals, both uh, Jewish festivals and uh, Muslim and Christian festivals. Uh, they enable um, an understanding of, a, of the history as it's perceived by the two, two different sides in the conflict. Um, uh, uh, they, they enable not just the children, but the whole of that wider community of people the children relate to uh, in that particular um, setting. So each of the organizations I'm referring to, in a sense, in their own way, has a way of facilitating these conversations. Uh, and they will be different organization to organization. But the common objective is to increase the understanding and break down the myths so that uh, the people uh, 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 who encounter each other um, do so from a, a greater place of understanding uh, as a result of those relationships. Thanks, John. John, John Crow, I think you've, you've got your raised, hand raised and, and then we'll go to Noel. Yes, I have. Thank you, indeed. Um, John Howard, uh, the early part of your uh, kind presentation, you mentioned that Oslo had run to the sand because uh, you uh, thought that the pre-groundwork had not been delivered upon adequately. And I wondered if you could briefly give some characterization to the components of pre-groundwork you think uh, uh, ought to be present in any uh, future attempt? I, I think that um, political conversations always take place in the context of, of a wider uh, community uh, and a, a point in history. Um, and um, the the groundwork that would seem to me that hadn't been done was this breaking down of myths and enabling conversations. But I think it was more than that. Um, another organization, which is a very interesting organization is called Roots. Now Roots is special in as much as um, uh, it seeks to bring together settlers, um, those who are part of the um, illegal settlement movement in the West Bank, um, settlers with Palestinians. Uh, and uh, I had um, a fascinating evening's conversation um, uh, with one of the rabbis involved in Roots, um, who um, was pointing out that um, one of the very um, powerful, motivating um, movements within Israel-Palestine that is not present in so much of the West where the Oslo Accords were, um, were envisaged um, is that of religious movement. Um, he, what he was arguing was that within Israel-Palestine, you um, couldn't neglect the religious aspect. Christ, uh, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam um, feature in a way in, in the Middle East that they don't feature in modern Western secular democracies. Uh, and um, so that um, the political conversations that took place didn't encounter um, the uh, various religious views and sensitivities. Um, and just one example of that uh, is that uh, under the Oslo Accords, uh, the, the concept of the two-state solution inevitably meant that 
some of the religious organization, uh, either Christians, uh, Muslims or Jews, were not going to have the kind of access that they sought as, the, as they saw as their right uh, to the holy sites of Jerusalem. Uh, in one way or another, um, one of those faith bodies, or more than one, was not going to have access. Whereas, of course, if you remember the um, uh, United Nations petition plan in 1948, had uh, the old city of Jerusalem as an international protectorate. And that had got, in a sense, totally lost from the Oslo Accords. Thank you. No, I, I think you had a question. You just need to, you need to unmute yourself, No. Yes, UNH Watcher. Um, what um, what significance is given by the, the ruling powers to this groundwork at present that you you can recognise? I would say not sufficient. Mm -hmm. um, there's it does depend a little bit about on what level you're speaking. Um, if you're speaking about at government level, I, I would argue, I would feel that, that there is far insufficient recognition of this kind of work uh, uh, um, by those in political authority at national level, both in the Palestinian Authority and in um, the Israeli government. Um, if you get more to um, more municipal um, uh, levels, there is far more recognition. Um, take, for example, um, uh, Tent of Nations, one of the, um, one of the organizations that I um, speak about in my, my book. Um, since the time of writing the book, Tent of Nations has had some very difficult times. Um, there's been a number of attacks and two uh, of the uh, people involved, um, uh, Daoud and Daher, um, were badly injured in uh, an attack um, uh, which took place. Um, but um, what happened afterwards was um, a remarkable number of the local leaders, municipal leaders, and indeed some people from the Palestinian Authority, um, came to uh, the project, to the farm, uh, and um, expressed their solidarity and their support for all of the work that um, Tent of Nations have been involved in uh, over many years. And I think that did illustrate that um, uh, at the more regional level, uh, the, the, the municipalities, there is a recognition of the importance of this kind of work. Uh, another example would be the Hand in Hand School uh, in Jerusalem, um, which suffered an attack by um, uh, um, an extremist group, and an, uh, and their uh, a number of classrooms were burnt down. Um, and um, subsequent to that, there was a huge response by the um, Jerusalem municipality. Um, and the authorities uh, at the, the kind of the city level uh, to what had happened. Um, but I, 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 would, I would argue strongly that at a national level, there is insufficient recognition of this work being done. And indeed that leads to the fact that many of these organizations are struggling for funding. They need to be better funded. Uh, and if they had the governmental support and Palestinian Authority level support, they would be far more likely to be able to um, expand their work uh, to a scale which would uh, be quite transformational. Yes. Uh, one more question, please, John, at, at this point. This being UN Day, um, what is the UN involvement in this and the, and the UN peace, peacekeeping? Well, the UN is involved in quite a series of different ways. Um, in different places. Um, uh, the um, UN OCHA, uh, Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, um, provides 
by far the most reliable statistical evidence of what's going on. Um, in any conflict situation, the danger always is that um, the information you get is partial. It's one-sided. It's um, uh, it's very difficult uh, in any conflict situation to be confident that you're getting the balanced view. And UN OCHA uh, works very hard to um, present clear statistics. Uh, uh, and uh, so that is one very important role. The UN is involved in quite a number of other ways. Uh, I mean, UNRWA, of course, the refugee agency uh, is very important. Um, in Gaza, um, when you're in Gaza, it's, it's just a huge um, proportion of the support for people is coming from UN UNRWA. Um, uh, and then on the Golan Heights, um, uh, the border with Syria, uh, there is actually a peacekeeping, um, UN peacekeeping force, uh, which um, uh, patrols the border between um, the, the Golan Heights and Syria itself. Um, now, given, a, given this is a UN evening, I'm sure some of you are also um, are far more knowledgeable of the details of some of this work uh, than I am. Um, I mean, my um, links to the UN in Palestine has um, have a, I've had quite a number of uh, occasions when I have linked uh, with the UN in Palestine, but um, uh, I'm not sure that I would be qualified to uh, outline all of the work the UN is doing there. What I would say is the work of OCHA, um, which I mentioned at the beginning, the Office of the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, is actually a very um, well-respected um, piece of work. Um, though, of course, uh, at times, politically, it is challenged, um, uh, and, and that's understandable in a conflict situation. Mm -hmm. But I, I would want to pay tribute to Ocha. Thank you. Perhaps just building upon on that thought and, and the link to the UN, uh, John, are, are there concrete steps that that we as as various UNA organizations across the central region can do and, and also linking this to, to your comment on the importance of relationship building you know, what what kind of actions can we take here uh, to support building peace and prosperity in, in the Middle East and also also elsewhere I think there would I'd want to divide it in a sense to um, political activity and um, uh, and um, economic activity. I mean, I I think it is so important that um, our politicians are aware of the role that UN plays within um, Israel Palestine, um, and that this the subject of the conflict in Israel Palestine is kept on the agenda of our politicians. I mean, especially in the recent years where there have been so many other issues uh, and there remains at present so many different issues um, that the subject of Israel Palestine, in a sense, doesn't get the kind of look in that it really needs to have if we're to get the uh, the the energy to bring about change. I think the second area that I want is, is that in a sense, the practical support, because um, the organizations that I've listed, and indeed, um, if, you, um, if you're reading chapter six of, of my book, I, I put at the end of the chapter, a reference to the fact that there are many other organizations who are also working on this whole question of the relationship between Israelis and Palestinians, um, and that, um, and all of them need financial support. Um, they all are needing that. And that financial support comes in part by the interest that people internationally um, show in, in, in this kind of work. Um, there's always such competition for funding. Uh, and so I think that is the second very important area. I think probably to add a third, um, be, being a, a Methodist minister, we always work in, uh, our sermons always work in three parts, and so perhaps I need to, um, the third part. Um, and that is simply the kind of support that we can give to people. 
Um, I'm conscious of some of the, I mentioned um, Daoud, Daher, uh, Nassar at the Tenter Nations. Um, but but um, um, th there's a whole raft of people giving their lives in this cause of bringing people together in Israel, Palestine, who in many cases um, find themselves um, confronted because of their commitment to bring people together. Uh, the support we can give to organizations like Musalaha, like Tender Nations, like um, Hand in Hand Schools and, uh, and so on, um, the, just the emotional support to people who are living their lives in the midst of conflict. Um, and uh, you know, that is itself an important contribution that we can make simply by giving support. Fantastic, thank you. I think, uh, Alex, do you, do you have a question? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Will. Fascinating um, talk as well. It's really, really insightful. We've sort of touched on it quite a bit in the last five minutes anyway, so it might be sort of be rehashing old ground. But what would be your, your sort of your perfect roadmap to sort of elevate the work of these grassroots organisations that obviously you see and um, firsthand throughout your work so they do have that opportunity at a more political level and um, to get the recognition that they sort of deserve and to be in the room with those political leaders so if you sort of had a list of things that you could put to um you know leaders in the region or to governments what what would sort of be on it to sort of make that transition from foundation to a lasting political dialogue um i, I think i'd want to encourage um financial support. Uh, if you take an organization like Musalaha, but also um, you know, put in all of these organizations, the amount of work they can do is in part governed by the resources that they have at their disposal. Uh, and uh, the more that government and, um, uh, and um, non-government organizations um, can give support, um, the more that the work can be expanded. Um, I mean, uh, Embrace the Middle East, uh, many of you will know Embrace the Middle East, and I, I've been very impressed with the way in which they work at supporting and funding and enabling grassroots organizations. They're not on the ground doing the particular work, but they are resourcing that work in being done. Now, if we could get a wider group of people seeing the value of working in that way, and particularly if we could get governments with the kind of financing um, they have to, to positively encourage and support uh, the range of work that's being done uh, to bring relationships together, uh, that could make uh, such a transformational um, difference. Um, I think the, the final thing I, I would say is it is not unimportant for individuals um, to make their contribution by being willing actually to give up some months, some time and volunteer to help these organisations. Uh, again, it's encouraging. It brings um, a, a sense of um, a wider interest in what's going on by people going there and being willing to actually um, spend some time um, with these different organizations. And all, I think pretty well every one of these organizations that I list in the book and many others that, that, um, uh, uh, that are on the ground are all asking for volunteers. And the more volunteers they get, the more that they can develop their work uh, more extensively. So um, uh, that, those would be some ways in which their work could be expanded. Fantastic. Are there any, are there any other questions at, at this point in, in time from anyone on, online? In, in, in which case, I think um, one, one of the, the points of, over this process and this journey of, of coming to this event and reading uh, Barry's newsletters uh, and reflecting on, on, on the journey that we've been on since the event 10, ten years ago, it, it prompted me to to consider a, a, few, a few 
tangible things that I can draw out from, from our experience and, and particularly the experience of the UNA Central Regional on what's making successful uh, UNA uh, activity at a branch level and, and across regions. And I think the, fir the first place to start is, is with values. Um, and, and many of you will be familiar with, with the, the seven values that, that Barry and, and UNA Shropshire branch um, governed the, the event 10 years ago in, in, in front of, to recall that being responsive, demonstrating integrity and grace exercising professionalism, forging partnerships, communicating transparently and cherishing learning. And I think many of these have been demonstrated in the activities uh, across the region over those 10 years. And I know Alex and Reese are, are going to touch on, on, on a reflection of, of different activities that have been happening since then. I think one, one clear one is the communicating transparently. And we live in an age where over the last 10 years, the ways that we communicate has, has transformed massively. I mean, the, the fact that we're here on a, on a Zoom call on a Monday evening across spanning many different households is, is testament to, to that in itself. So John, I think one question that I had reflecting on, on the role of, of, of values in particular in, in bringing about act, action, and also particularly on how we trans, uh, how we transparently communicate. From your experience, are, are there particular best ways to, trans, uh, to to communicate what's going on across the Middle East with different audiences? And, and how how did you see those different organisations, those different grassroots organisations, communicate? You're asking a very wide question in a sense there. Um, one of the things which um, was said um, back in um, the time of the Second Intifada uh, was come see, go tell. Um, the, the, the importance of people who have actually been able to see what's taking place on the ground, then being able to communicate what it is they have seen. Um, there's um, not everybody, of course, can can actually travel to be, to go to um, see the situation to actually see it themselves, and so therefore um, the the importance of those who have travelled and been um, uh, uh, in the West Bank and Gaza and um, in Israel, uh, then finding the opportunities uh, and, uh, and the platforms where they can actually talk and communicate what it is they've seen uh, and what it is they've heard. Um, uh, um, if it's not possible to come see and actually then go and tell, then at least um, doing the telling on the part of those who have been able to come and see uh, is so important. Um, but uh, I think I would also want to um, emphasize what I've mentioned already, but um, uh, and that is um, the communication takes place as a result of the statistics of the UN OCHA. Um, it's possible to actually um, be on their um, mailing list uh, and, and receive a regular uh, statistical update, uh, uh, their humanitarian briefing. Um, and um, I, I receive that about every two weeks, um, which outlines not only um, uh, what has taken place over the last couple of weeks, um, uh, but also uh, some of the impact that's had on the various communities concerned. Uh, so as a piece of communication, um, it's reliable, uh, it's informative, uh, and it comes regularly by email, so it's easy to receive. So, I mean, I would suggest that that is uh, something that's very valuable for those who um, are uh, concerned to keep up to date and um, uh, uh, um, be in touch with what's going on um, through that mechanism. Fantastic. I, I mean, that's, uh, I'd imagine there's probably a few pens scribbling, scribbling that down now because uh, I'm sure that'll be of interest to many people on, on the call to receive that kind of information. I think the the other the other point I reflected on, which your book also brought out, John, was the importance of, of vision and having a shared vision. 
um, across the, the different organisations and communities that you were working with. Can you can you speak a bit to the role of having visions, shared visions, and in, in bringing about action and change? Uh, vision is, of course, a, um, a kind of word which which needs expanding in so many different directions. I mean, one of the um, one of the problems that exists in Israel, in particularly in Palestine, but I think in Israel Palestine as a whole, uh, is the whole question of what is the vision for um, the future. Um, the organizations that I've been speaking of and the ones that you know I'm, I'm trying to affirm uh, you know are holding this vision of a society that is not divided in the way that it has become divided um, and when you have um, a, um, a deliberate government policy of erecting a separation barrier between the areas um, that vision of being um, in a relationship with each other uh, across the divide is itself um, a vision that, that unites these different organizations that I've been speaking of. Um, the, the wider vision of, um, of um, people in the country is, is more difficult to speak of. I mean, I think it is fair to say that um, if you were to speak to Israeli um, citizens, you would get a different vision for the future than if you speak to Palestinians. In a sense, it illustrates the need of the organizations in, to develop the relationships because those visions are so different. Um, so that illustrates the amount of work still uh, needs to be done. And, and on that front in, in particular, is that where the role of youth uh, and, and particular youth organisations or, or organisations that focus on young people become critically important? Undoubtedly. Um, and I think that when we talk about youth, we have to remember how young a society um, um, so the um, Palestinian society in particular is. It's true of Israel as well as Palestine. Uh, it is a far younger community than, than we're used to in Britain, for example. But um, um, the majority of the population of Palestine is below the age of 25. And so that illustrates how important uh, work amongst youth is. Um, of course, I think it's also important to work with other age groups as well. Uh, and it is possible to be um, neglectful of, of the, the um, um, importance of those who are in leadership roles being helped themselves to develop relationships across the divide. Uh, and those leadership roles are held on the whole by people in, uh, in a more senior age group. I, I, can, I can completely sympathise with that. I think one of the real uh, takeaways from from the event that we held in Church Stratton ten years ago is is the involvement of of young people, and I think many many actions came out of that event uh, that are still lasting to to this day, either formally or or informally, uh, about involving young people in in the work of the United Nations uh, and, and and in the branches across the region. Perhaps that's a, a nice segue, if, if we've not got any questions at this particular point, um, to, to approach Reese and Alex uh, for their kind of comments and reflections on the, the activity that has been going on across the region and, and further afield following that event and, and your reflections and summary of progress on, on that. Yeah, sh should I start? Yeah. Um, so. I hope that I can speak for all of the young people, um, many of us really quite young at that time, who attended the um, Church Strata Conference 10 years ago, um, in saying that we really were quite inspired. 
um, by the work that the United Nations Association does. And we came away from that quite keen to promote um, UNA more to young people um, in the local area. Um, and we had some success in doing this over the years following um, 2012. Um, for instance, the year after, in 2013, um, Barry, um, David Oliver, and I, we met a peace campaigner called BJ Mehta, who was really a lifelong um, activist, um, campaigner for dis global disarmament. Um, and he'd written a book called The Economics of Killing, which he was promoting at the time. And we asked him to give a talk at Concord College um, to young people, mainly from the Far East, um, who were high school students in, in, in Shropshire. Um, and he did that. And many of you in UNA Shropshire may already be aware of that. But what you might not know is that the following year after that, um, I met um, Vijay at Cambridge. Um, and I told him that I was very interested in what he, what, what he was doing and his, his organization and his book. Um, and I asked him to give the same um, talk again. And he did so. And he did so at Newcastle under Lyme School in North Staffordshire um, in February 2014. So um, through these events, a number of young people in the local area were made aware um, of the kind of thing the United Nations Association does. Um, and it was from that starting point um, that William and Alex Williams and Hastan, Hastan Safdar and I um, propelled ourselves into the leadership of the central region, which is the body that lies between the bra branch organizations like UNA Shropshire and um, UNA UK. And this happened in, in late 2014-15 period, and we developed an action plan, um, and we, we proposed various policies, which perhaps Alex can talk about. Yeah, thanks, Reese. I definitely remember the 2014 one. Um, because I remember Barry, correct me if I'm wrong here, but that was when you had, was it the um, link to the Rugby World Cup, the Birmingham Rugby Partnership? Um, I think they did a session that morning um, and the AGM was was the afternoon. And it actually got me thinking as well, because obviously we've got the, the World Cup coming up in Qatar, obviously in November. I just wonder sort of, you know, given the controversy sort of surrounding, you know, who's hosting it, the controversy as to why it's 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 you know there's an issue there with you know repression of certain rights freedom of expression you know if you're an lgbtq person apologies there's fireworks going on outside um in that country what does it mean for them but i just wonder maybe if that's if that's a thought we could take away for the future perhaps um but yeah i think we had a lot of ambitions with holding a school's mun um, and I remember we did get some of the work sort of off the ground on that, especially with Nottingham MUN Society. But I think one of the issues that I found is that if you tend to get people involved with UNA work or the, or the central region, they tend to be university students. And then you're sort of locked into a three year period with them. And if, if you don't get that succession planning right and early on, you know, w w once you've sort of hit two, three years down the line, you can sort of lose, you know, a group of invested individuals. So what I sort of say moving forward in terms of what the central region becomes after this, uh, after this review, and I I'm sure there'll be some actions from it, is to sort of look at, you know, if we are going to build a new strategy, how do we ensure that people are going to be there to undertake it? Um, but yeah, I'd say other things as well that we did early on after 2012, we did I think Will was there as well for this, the social media training, which I thought was really, really good. Um, and obviously, as you were saying now, you know, it, it is the main sort of communication tool um, in politics, in, in anything really in 2022. Um, so yes, yeah, so in terms of my takeaways from it, I think we had quite a lively sort of five, six years following the, the 2012 event, but I think issues with succession and how you sort of get the next generation on board that's that's where we sort of fell short a little bit um but yeah but sort of happy to sort of take any thoughts on on, on how we sort of move the central region to the next stage so can i say one thing um one thing we did do i think successfully um while we we're running the central region although sadly we weren't actually able to hold an event and hold modern united nations that we wanted to um is we did improve communications 
between the branches in the region. Um, and we did sort of create a sense of event by sending out sort of quarterly um, newsletters, um, which detailed all the events that were going on in the region. And often these were in quite different places like Shropshire, Coventry, Warwick. Um, and I think actually to their credit, branch chairs were very, were very engaged with this and very involved with this. Um, and everyone seemed quite keen to share information with each other. We did a lot on social media as well. We developed a Facebook page, which at the time was more interesting and innovative than it is now. Um, and people seemed quite excited about that as well. And obviously this didn't last, sadly, because because as Alex has said, we didn't have anyone to hand over to with no succession planning. Um, but for a time, um, we did improve communication between the branches. And if people did want to take over the, um, the leadership of the central region again in future, um, there is perhaps a template they could follow in that respect. Well, could, could, could I say? Excuse me, can I come in here, please? <clears throat> Absolutely. Is that you? I think I heard both Barry and Gian at the same time. So I don't yes, know who would like. Well, Gian, I, I was I was chairman of the Central Region from 1994 in 2012 until you chaps came in and took over. Now, Reese mentioned about communication. From 2013, we received no communication whatsoever uh, as a branch, and to my knowledge. No meeting had been held since 2013 14. No, uh, no AGMs of the region or any meetings, to our knowledge, had been held. You may, held, may have held it at university premises. That's fine. But ordinary UNA branches and members did, had no, no knowledge. But to date, my knowledge, as far as I know, central region is, is defunct because I was still the treasurer, the uh, uh, check holder to date since 2013, no bank transaction had been taken. So therefore from that you can surmise the central region, while as I'm concerned, had ceased to exist because there had been no annual general meetings to elect a, treasurer, a chairman, uh, a secretary or a treasurer. Well, could I go back to Alex's question about, um, he mentioned about uh, the social media work. He also mentioned about the importance of bringing people together. Um, we were at the UNA headquarters uh, event where the lady who captained the Palestinian women's football team on the West Bank, um, stage football matches, both sexes football matches, mixing the Israelis and Palestin uh, Palestinians together, and how much benefit sport brought to to the um, to, to building the relationships. Uh, and Jeff Jeff Perkis may, has mentioned to me only the other day about Daniel Borenbein's um, orchestra of Israelis and Palestinians. And I'd love Jeff to say something about the good that that did uh, in his opinion, because the importance of bringing people together, which has been a theme coming out of the, uh, the, the contribution so far, uh, sport was a happy medium, including the Rugby World Cup. But Jeff, could you say something about Daniel Borenboim? Well, uh, only in general terms. First of all, Daniel Borenboim is now in his 80s and apparently not in good health. And so I'm not sure whether that orchestra is still going. But the great thing about music is that it's a common language um, across different nationalities. Um, and um, and I, I can only suggest that as um, as as a backup to um, to what um, uh, John Howard was saying earlier on, it it could continue to be valuable if 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 anybody is taking over uh, from Daniel if he's no longer well enough to do it. But um, I don't have any up to date knowledge other than what I've read in Wikipedia. Yes. Well, perhaps John Howard might know something about what Daniel Bonboyne's orchestra has achieved or not achieved. 
I mean, I've, I've, I couldn't give any particular knowledge. Um, I mean, I've heard of it and um, I've heard people pay tribute to it. Um, there is more than one um, music project operating um, uh, in the West Bank um, with musicians. Um, uh, and um, again, they share the objective of bringing people together. Um, um, I'm trying to think, uh, the name has slipped for the moment from my mind of um, uh, within the Ida refugee camp in Bethlehem, um, uh, the one of the community centers in, in the Ida camp um, uh, do, uh, does have a music project which uh, uh, seeks to um, in, encourage uh, participation. So, I mean, I think there are projects and the, down, um, the Brown Boyne um, one was the most famous. And it's certainly a contribution that can be profitably made. And John, from your experience, can the same be said for these sporting organisations, you know, music and sport, but both being common languages that could across different communities? I, I think the potential is there. Um, it, has, it has to be said that there have been problems and um, uh, in relation to the Palestinian football team, uh, and um, uh, I mean, some people probably will be aware of the fact that there have been um, issues around whether some of the players in the Palestinian football uh, national football team were allowed to leave the West Bank um, because, of course, they needed permits from the Israeli authorities, and um, those have not always been granted. So that actually has ended up not so much bringing people together, but, but emphasizing the divisions uh, on some occasions. Um, alongside that, there is also, and here we get into controversial questions, uh, the BDS movement um, uh, are keen on um, discouraging uh, sporting um, occasions uh, engaging with Israel on the basis that it is normalizing the, the present situation. So I think sport is a rather more complicated situation than music, I, uh, I would suggest. Yes, That's very interesting. To, yeah. I tend to concur with, um, with the gentleman uh, because in Leamington, um, we've got a justice for the Palestinians and they had arranged a football game with, in, with the local youth um, uh, club to go to uh, the, the, uh, to Gaza to play um, football there with some of the teams, and unfortunately, um, a lot of the members were uh, not granted um, visas uh, uh, for reasons unknown to anyone. So there was a lot of problems when they did get to Gaza, uh, as uh, the gentleman just that's exactly the issues um, with sporting event our youth centre in Leamington had experienced. So, uh, Thank you, Gert. Yeah, that, I think that's, it, it's good to hear that unfortunately these things are, are, mm. are resonating with people and these challenges are actually very real. Mm. Uh, and I think mm. there's various instances that, that Barry and, and Alex and Reese mentioned where sport can give hope, but it's not a, a uniform that can solve all problems. Picking up on, on one other uh, comment that, that Alex and Reese touched upon in, 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 touched upon in, in uh, relation to the central region, and, and I think it's probably common across many branches. And I'd like your, your input, John, on, on succession planning and how you see succession planning happen across the region to maintain uh, these movements, these grassroots organizations, when when there is change within their leadership, I, I would I would say that it, it varies with organization. Um, um, I think Barry is aware that that uh, Musalaha has recently been going through this, um, and um, I think probably has handled it extremely well. And um, the next generation of leadership in Musalaha is now um, taking the reins very effectively. Um, uh, 
my impression would be that um, uh, I think, as I say, I would I would put it that different organisations uh, handle this in different ways. Some more successfully uh, than others. Um, I mean, I, I was reflecting upon um, uh, a while back now, um, WIAM, which is a um, um, conflict resolution organisation, but it also um, acts as a, um, a forum for um, discussions um, and um, how the leadership there had consciously sought to um, train and um, enable and facilitate the next generation of leadership. Um, and that is, I think, a, is, is a very good example of, of, of this happening. Um, but inevitably, these things uh, do depend upon um, the particular individuals leading the organizations at the time. Mm -hmm. Perhaps on that note, it's a, it's a good point to, to go to Colin, uh, Colin Bryant from, from Muslaha. Uh, for, for your reflections, not just on, on that point, but overall, uh, and, and perhaps you can, now we are, uh, everybody's on, on the call, a shorter overview of, of Musulaha itself. I think you're, you're on mute, Colin. Done it. You can hear me. Yeah. Yes. That's great. Uh, there's a number of things. I mean, oh, sorry, my screen has gone funny. Yes, we can. Can you can you see me? Yes. yes. Can you hear me? Yep. Yes. yes. I've lost you. you. I don't know why. Yep. Okay. Well, I will just speak to a funny screen. Um. I mean, the conversations tonight were really very interesting and uh, they, they, they ring true. Um, one of the things I wanted to mention, uh, to point out, was keeping sight of opposites. Certainly in uh, Musulaha, um, one of the things is... Uh, being able to hear what your enemy is saying so that hearing and then being received in what you say uh, is really important. And indeed, there's a book that Musalha has published uh, called Through My Enemy's Eyes, in which two people uh, go through the history and the dynamic of what's happening uh, in, in great detail. And that was very painful for them, but they, they did it and published it. And it reminds me of Jesus nearly getting lynched at Nazareth as a historical uh, thing um, when uh, he was handling sort of opposite views uh, and uh, what the local people expected Messiahs to do with the Romans and that Jesus was clearly contradicting this. That's a, an interesting historical parallel. I came across last week, or a, a, a little while ago, a piece of research that um, one of the newsletters in Muslaha website um, ha, has uh, come across, where there was some research that said if you can get 3.5% of the population uh, communicating and uh, being on board, that can lead to change. And that's a very surprising number, I think. And it fits with several things that have been said tonight. Uh, and it may be worth looking, your, your group looking at that research. I think the research was quite good. I haven't read it, but I have just read an account of it. The next thing I'd want to say is that Muslaha is developing some internet 
uh, video training on uh, reconciliation. It's not quite ready to send out yet or to use, uh, but that's possible. Um, and you already know about the reconciliation cycle, which has a parallel with uh, some of your um, diagrams that you work to. The other thing that I'd like to say is that there is a, uh, a, a person who was the chairman of the UK branch, and um, he has left the UK branch at the moment to form a company called Boundary Breakers. And that he's got a kind of depth of knowledge that's really quite uh, matches John's, John Howard's. Um, and he is specializing in arranging bespoke visits for both groups and individuals that take people beneath the surface in the situation. Uh, one of the trips that he's uh, developing at the moment is for a group from an American Air Force base to, to, to visit and uh, be involved. And that I think speaks of the, uh, of several things of the width and trust that he's held in. Um, the thing about Muslahar is that it focuses on grassroots and building relationships. Uh, and uh, its time and energy is focused uh, on that. The other thing that I'd say about your own group is that it reminds me of knowledge management, which is uh, a movement that started in 1990s to uh, 2000, and which I learned quite a bit about in my past. And uh, it seems to me that you are using similar techniques and potentially they are very powerful. Um, and I admire your meticulous attention to detail. Uh, and I think one of your things that has made your group successful is that you've had John Howard on site over a long period of time, giving a real life perspective um, there. The, uh, just following up that keeping the ability to keep up, hearing two opposite views without siding, both individuals and churches in the UK and indeed, especially in America, probably, um, there is a great tendency when one, a church or an individual has heard the narrative from one of the sides that they think that that's, that's it. And they focus uh, on supporting that bit. And I think part of the trick, part of the secret of making progress in these matters is um, being able to hold, the, have the ability to hold the perspective that are perspectives that are contradictory and relate to people in that situation. The other thing that I'd say is that um, the, the problems that are faced by people in Israel and Palestine, if you'll forgive me saying this, because it sounds a bit odd to say it, um, it's their problem. That's a kind of counseling thing to say. That means that they have to take responsibility and we cannot take responsibility for that as such. We can support and probably one of the greatest things we can do in terms of supporting is simply to listen and to hear and to take an interest in. Um, that seems to me a very um, hidden, but very powerful method. And it goes back to that 3.5% that's needed, uh, uh, that even with that small percentage, um, that can be uh, uh, a, a foundation for change. Now I'm going to try and get back on uh, being able to see you which may mean that I cut myself off, but uh, 
Is there anybody listening? Yes. 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 And, and we can you. see you. Well, we can so see you. If, if, I yes. loo- if I'm lost for a moment, I'll try and get back and uh, get a proper screen here because I can't I, see anything. I think oh. when you stop talking, the other people will come big. Right. Are we, are we bigger yet, Colin? <laughs> no, I, there must be something I can press somewhere. But... <laughs> I, perhaps if you, if you go into the top right on view. No, that, think... that, that's disappeared. Can, can you, you can still hear us, you, you just can't see us. I can us, hear Colin. you all right. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to have a Do fresh... Do you start. have a Zoom icon at the bottom of your screen? Right at the bottom, a blue Zoom icon. I, don't, I can't see one, no. Okay. Uh, let, let me just go out and come back because uh, I think okay. that will work. Um, I mean, I can, I, can, I can dialogue with people as I am at the moment, but... Uh, uh, that I've only got sound. Perhaps, first of all, thank you, Colin, for your reflections because I think they were they were very interesting yeah. for the whole yeah. break. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, yeah. I, I mean, are there any immediate questions for Colin whilst he's whilst he can still hear us at least, um, or, or follow up comments that people have got from them? I have um, a, a question. Super. Hello. Please go ahead, Noel. I have a question um, about the process. Uh, we, we, ten years ago, we had a, a conference, um, and now we have a review. Uh, I was, I was a bit confused about was review of the conference or a review of of uh, the situation on the ground. Um, that has been my confidence been restored with John Howard's um, information, but. My question is, what is the process from here? Is, there, is this the end of it, as far as we, we, we see here? Or is there, other, is there another mechanism we can use to support this work ongoing? Is that a question for the, the United Nations Association, or is it a question for me? It's a question for all of us, I think. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's I think it's a fantastic question. But uh, Barry, I can see you've got your hand up there. Do you want yes. to jump in? I think it's a fantastic question, also. Mm-hmm. But, but I think we've got ten minutes. I think there may be other, and I think we should have the opportunity to reflect on what we've learned tonight to be able to give Noel a serious answer. I, can, I completely agree, and, and perhaps on, on the on the reflection, we can go to to Philip for for the final overall reflection of the evening. And perhaps Philip, you can also reflect on on Noel's question in an immediate sense. Uh, but I completely agree with Barry that we'll we'll take some time from that um, from from your your stance in UNA Coventry and and also being part of Coventry Peace and Reconciliation. Well. Um... I have to admit, I'm certainly far from being um, an expert in this area. Uh, I'm, as far as Israel and Palestine is concerned, for me, I'm just an ordinary citizen who, uh, who would like the situation to change but cannot see any clear way forward. Um, as far as this event was concerned, um, I've I've learned a lot. So I've joined this event. I've found out about John Howard's book. I just bought it, and I'm reading it on my Kindle as I speak. And I'm very grateful for that opportunity. It looks like something really valuable, um, and I shall publicise that on on our websites to make to let people know about it. Um, I mean. Perhaps this this isn't the right thing for me to say, but I'm not sure what this whole project is trying to achieve in the long run. I thought it was to try and promote dialogue between 
Israelis and Palestinians, but I'm not sure. Um, but I mean, it doesn't matter because if you're happy with what you're doing, that's the main thing. Um, I mean, I, I think one of the one of the aims that Barry talked about was to prepare a revised plan um, and you know think about the future. And I'm not sure that that's been addressed, has it? I don't know. But I mean, it's been very worthwhile, and I, I've recorded this. And as, I mean, as long as the recording works, it doesn't always work properly, but as long as it's publishable, I plan to publish it on YouTube and I will, just, I will send links to Barry um, so that he can distribute them, unless anybody objects to me publishing what's been said. Does that, does that help? I think that's a very good start. And, and perhaps Barry, you wish to to comment on the uh, the overall objectives and and where we're going to take it from here. Because I I think as I as I mentioned in my opening remarks, this is this is neither the start nor the end, but a, a, a moment in time of of the uh, United for Peace and Prosperity event and and, and its follow up. So Barry, I don't, would you like to give give your comments and reflections? I mean, Barry's put a yes. huge amount of 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 effort and work, which I think we're all incredibly grateful for, uh, <laughs> providing the newsletters um, and really following up on this with such passion and vigor. So, Barry, I, I'd, I'd love to hear from, from you and your reflections. Yes. Well, what I've heard tonight, what I've, um, the object of tonight was another step along the road, a major step. And these objectives were established by UNA Shropshire branch in January 2012. And I can confirm that what's happened tonight is totally consistent with the objectives of 10 years ago. And the particular objective um, was quoted in the specification anybody classification for the project. Um, uh, and what I've heard tonight actually strengthens the chances of achieving the objectives. And when the transcript of this particular evening has been um, recorded and, and when it has been um, translated and summarized, uh, I think I can demonstrate that the information that has been recorded is totally consistent with the objective. So Philip, because Coventry didn't have a branch until 2016, and because you weren't part of initially the things, I do understand your point of view, I'll take care in communicating with you both the objectives and how what the transcript of the night how it strengthens the prospects now there's all sorts of opportunities have cropped up from the notes that i've made etc and it isn't my job to decide on which opportunities are grasped it is the una central region uh, opportunities and I've been talking to Will about the next AGM for the UNA Central Region. And with Alex and Reese, we've got to decide uh, when that's going to be, but it's likely to be within the next month. And hopefully by then, we'll have some good pointers on what the next steps are in the general aim, which and I quote, is to review the impact of what's happened so far on United, uh, from United for Peace and Prosperity, uh, and from the findings, create new plans and priorities. And I think the way we've moved forward is being in regular contact with organizations like Musulaha and Colin Bryant, which I've benefited enormously. Initially, I thought, Musalaha was the striker from Liverpool Football, Football Club 
Um, but I've learned a lot <laughs> since because he, <laughs> he being energies, uh, I thought he had some connection. But but no, so I, I'm really grateful both to Philip and particularly to Will, Reese, and Alex for the teamwork that we've experienced in putting this together and the contact uh, of what Noel has said with John Howe has been absolutely invaluable. And we would not have had that without the, 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 the relationship between UNA Shropshire and John when he was based in Wolverhampton and he was a regular visitor to this part of the world. He's now in County Durham which is also God's own country, as, as you would all know, <laughs> as you will all know. So <coughs> I'm really pleased with what I've heard and to see Hasnan and to listen to about Cam when he went to Cambridge and did the model UNA uh, at Cambridge, to see John Crow who joined, <coughs> this, who joined UNA in his first event was the UN uh, Peace and Prosperity in the Sylvester Horn in 2012. So we got ourselves a new chairman, eventual chairman, and to see my old friend, Jeff Perkis, whom I worked with for many years and learned of so much from Jeff, and David Oliver, who at the event in, in the Sylvester Horn, not only was the gatekeeper, but uh, made way for, um, uh, other people, so he could leave the top table and sit at the back, <laughs> and issues like that. And to, to see the Warwick branch here, um, in both Gian and, and Caroline, uh, it was a joy. I'm so pleased that you could come, and you were able to s say your piece about uh, what, what you saw happening. And I'm sure we can talk again of how we build on that. And Elizabeth from and Joe from Belgium, um, I'm pleased that you had the had the chance to join in. And Hannah, Hannah, who's from who's from UNA Scotland, who hasn't said anything yet, but her she's vice chairman of UNA Scotland, and and uh, we're looking forward to building relationships, which ha have been damaged between England and Scotland in a political sense but not in a United Nations sense, Hannah. So thank you for part, being part. And Char Charles Croydon from, uh, was it East Anglia, Charles? Yes, I'm the uh, chair Ipswich. of the Ipswich uh, District Branch. Yes, so we we feel, and uh, Alison, Alison, where are you from? Uh, Merson. So London and South East region, well, rather than Central region. I'm very grateful to have been here. Very yeah. interesting evening. Bob, Bob Welsh, who was at the time, um, he wasn't, he was a councillor and he wasn't quite mayor, but Tom Bowman and his wife uh, were there and Tom Bowman was mayor and, and Bob was a successor of mayor of Church Stretton. So, um, Overall, and Mark, Mark, you haven't said anything from Montgomery, but you, you're well informed about the Middle East. So when you get the notes from this meeting, your comments particularly um, uh, will be extremely valuable yeah. to deciding on what goes up, what, what, how we move forward. Thank you for coming. Thank so you. Back, to, back to you, Will. Thank you very much, Barry. I, I don't think there's uh, much more I can add to that to conclude uh, in, in a better way. So I, I did promise that we'd be punctual with our time, which I think we've been throughout. So uh, I can only add my thanks on behalf of everybody to all of those who've contributed this evening, and in particular to, to John Howard for his reflections and uh, wisdom and experience from being on the ground, because that's been really vital and, and also incredibly interesting for everybody. I'd like to say if, if you've got any reflections, ideas uh, and, and comments following this evening, it would be fantastic to hear. So please, I think everybody's got Barry's contact 
uh, and and he can pass on mine but also and we can uh, look to see where where this goes from here so unless anybody's got any other final comments that they really wish to i i uh, wish you a, a, a fond good evening thank you will no thank you very much thank you thank you everyone thank you thank you thank, thank, you. thank you thank you thank you thank you thank you thank you yes thank you very much thank you Oops.